Good uh, afternoon, I'm Bill Sproul, and <clears throat> I'll start off, I think everyone here from time to time has thought about what would the world be like if we really were able to implement a renewable energy framework or network throughout the world and get off fossil fuels and even extend the, that to our transportation so that we're using the renewable energies that now are becoming very cost effective to uh, really give us a very robust energy environment. A lot of issues with that and uh, that's where energy storage comes into play. So energy storage systems, uh, what we're addressing is really trying to enable a high penetration of renewables in the, uh, in the uh, grid. And as we heard just before lunch, that was one of the main questions I think that came up is, okay, you can do this, you can do it efficiently, but how are you going to extend it 24 hours a day? Energy storage systems is out in Portland, Oregon. We're a four-year-old startup. We uh, are focused on bringing energy storage solutions to utility scale and down behind the meter to commercial industrial scale. We've got a team that uh, came out of the fuel cell world. They applied some of the know-how in fuel cells to some existing uh, chemistry that's been worked on, actually at Case Western University years ago. Uh, the all iron chemistry and uh, fundamentally made it a durable, long life and uh, doesn't degrade over time. So the problem that we're addressing is the, the intermittency of renewables. Uh, when the sun's shining, the wind's blowing, everything's going fine. But the problem is you have clouds that come over and you have wind gusts that come and go. And uh, when you start to get high penetrations as they do in Hawaii and, some, and even in California now, you start to see the whole load profile of the grid start to change. And with that, the control of the grid becomes an issue. So taking out the intermittencies even minute to minute uh, are a big issue. Uh, in the way of trying to get deep penetrations. And obviously, we've, we've talked about and thought about uh, remote areas of the world where they are not on the grid and they, they live with electricity for a few hours a day, getting more 24-7 reliable power to those places as well is a, a key problem. So the solution that we're working on is energy storage. And basically, we're a long duration storage technology that can take big blocks of energy from solar or wind during the day and move it to a different part of the day. Or we can fill up at night on low cost energy and, and uh, put it out onto the grid or into the facility during the day. Obviously, we would enable the uh, renewables to be 24 seven continuous power. And there's an ability within the storage system to control microgrids. So now you can start to decentralize the grid and put communities or uh, campuses and things like that on their own grids and within their own control. On this chart, you can see a, an example down below a facility on the left. You have uh, several things going on at that facility. The, the building is in blue, so that's the normal load of a manufacturing plant or an office building, people come in to work in the morning, they plug in their electric vehicles, that's what the green is there. So all these electric vehicles are charging in the parking lot. The sun comes up and you start to get the intermittent generation of solar on the yellow, and the black line represents what's happening on the grid. This is what the grid operator is seeing from that facility. And you can see it has dramatic swings. Everybody plugged in their electric vehicle at the same moment and you've got that huge spike. The sun, the clouds parted and the sun really started generating electricity, you've got the big trough. When you bring in storage to the picture, as you can imagine, we can smooth that out and we can control that level at which makes sense for the grid, makes sense for the facility, makes sense economically. The, the key element with energy storage, like with renewables for the last 10 years, is it has to be cost effective. And that's one of the challenges now as we move from lead acid to lithium ion to other chemistries with energy storage, is how do we make a long life, uh, as long as the renewable energy project type life, 20, 25 years, very cost effective solutions so that when you start to marry the renewable and the storage, you can start to reach grid parity in a lot of the markets, that, uh, in a lot of the major markets. 
So, and it also has to be safe. You don't want a lot of toxicity out there or fire danger, and it needs to be resilient and have the life of the typical renewable energy. So what we're working on is an all iron flow battery. It's using earth abundant iron, very inexpensive. It uses earth, excuse me, iron, salt, and water. Uh, it has a very low pH and the state of charge is very low, so we don't degrade cycle after cycle after cycle. So we've had great success in getting tens of thousands of cycles out of this battery. Uh, it's a long duration capacity. What we're doing is we're actually plating and deplating iron onto a membrane. And so as we cycle charge and discharge, we can store up to eight, 10 hours of uh, capacity in the electrolyte and uh, at the rated power. And we can survive tens of thousands of cycles. So we're now talking a 20 year, 20 through 24 five-year type uh, lifetime, which is, again, comparable to the uh, renewable energies that we want to interface with. And the only real moving parts in this are some water pumps and some sensors and things like that. So that's the O&M of this, we believe, will be very minimal and just paying attention to water pumps and sensors. The chemistry is fairly simple. It's iron on both sides, so you don't have the cross-migration and contamination issues that you'd worry about. It's elegant in the way that we control it. So previous work has had an issue trying to maintain the efficiency over time and cycle after cycle. And we've uh, incorporated a control scheme that uh, demonstrates and proves that. Again, it's a very benign, uh, safe electrolyte using iron, salt, and water. And it's actually reusable at the end of the life. At 20, 25 years, that electrolyte is in the same condition it was when you first put it together. The workhorse of it is a battery stack, which is separate from the electrolyte. And that's where the difference of a flow battery is, is you separate all the electrolyte, which is really the storage media, from where the power is generated in the battery stack. Because it's a non-corrosive type electrolyte, we can use very low cost plastics and carbon plates and things like that. Uh, the chart on the right, lower right, demonstrates the cyclability and the efficiency over time, over many cycles. And you can see on the upper right, during the development period, how we uh, increase the performance on the power density over time. As I mentioned, the power module is made up of uh, fairly inexpensive materials, a lot of plastics and uh, carbon uh, graphite plates which leads to a very inexpensive cost. And what we did was we put together last year our first field deployable prototype. That's a 10 kilowatt, 75 kilowatt hour system. And that was uh, done under an RPE grant. And from that, we felt that we had gotten through enough validation testing that we could uh, solidify the design and start moving into production. We're actually going to be shipping our first unit to a customer next month to a vineyard in Sonoma, California, and a microgrid project. And then another one right behind that is going to the Army Corps of Engineers. So th those are leading to commercialization next year. And our building block product is going to be 125 kilowatt, one megawatt hour storage capacity. And that will be both behind the meter type applications and grid scale. Uh, renewable energy type applications. I, I mentioned the cost, and that's really the key. So getting the capital cost down, having low cost electrolyte, and not having to replace the batteries five, ten years in is really the key that all comes together with the iron flow battery. So when you marry up solar, which has come down dramatically in cost over the last uh, ten years, with the storage in volume, we think we can get the le levelized cost of energy to about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And that matches up with grid parity in many markets today. So within the next few years, I think this will be a real alternative in most markets uh, around the world. And uh, I think we'll see a big change in the way power is delivered uh, and power is used around the world. So our path to commercialization we're focused on developing and building and going to market with this cost competitive solution. Uh, our market focuses on long duration storage, tied to renewables, 
and doing the time shifting or uh, smoothing of renewables. And we've completed the testing, we've validated the design, we're ready to move to uh, production in 2016. And one of the big steps uh, to bring down the cost of this is the tooling and developing hard tooling so that we can mold the plates and mold the uh, carbon graphite uh, bipolar plates. And so what we have identified as our lowest hanging fruit is about $140,000 investment in a, a tool to produce millions of uh, plates. And if we are fortunate enough to, uh, to win the award, uh, we would apply that $100,000 to that. About 12 weeks later, we've got a very expensive, inexpensive plate. And uh, will get us a long ways toward that $300 per kilowatt hour target that we have, which I think will be competitive against just about any storage technology out there today uh, that is at this scale. So with that, I thank you and uh, appreciate uh, your, your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks. That was great, Bill. We have a question right away. Um, can you talk about the balance between the unit and the storage tanks? Um, you, you show a picture of a, uh, a, a large unit with tanks in the bank. What happens right. if you double the size of the tanks? Does that increase the storage, or is there a limited capacity on, uh, or the amount of storage, is there a limited capacity of For the, the individual units in the system? Right. That's a good question, because it varies by different chemistries. Uh, there's other flow batteries, like a vanadium flow battery, where it's just a function of how big do you want to make the tank, and you just keep flowing it through. What we did, as I mentioned, is we plate the iron onto a membrane and then deplate it when we're charging and discharging. So there is a capacity limit, not only in how much electrolyte you put in the tank, but in how much plating you can do on that stack. So I mentioned the 125 uh, kilowatt power level is our interface and a megawatt hour is about eight hours of storage is the nominal value. We can do excursions 150% of the 125 power for a short period of time. We could add more uh, electrolyte and get up to maybe 10 or 12 hours at that power rating, but by then you've totally plated as much iron as you can. So we are capacity limited uh, to some degree by this, the power stacks, the battery stacks. But uh, like most flywheel batteries, it's the amount of electrolyte that you have. Bill, I just want to ask a question. Yeah. You, you had mentioned the electrolyte is recyclable, and you said after 25 years you could pull it out. Are you contemplating a 25-year life of, of this product? It, we are, yeah. Because wow. if you take 10,000 cycles, if you're cycling once a day, that's beyond 20 years. Fabulous. And this, this technology could easily cycle several times a day, depending on what the use is, what you're trying to accomplish at a facility. Great. I, I, uh, talk a little more about um, the competitive nature and aspects that's out there. It's obviously a relatively crowded space. It's hard to differentiate. Uh, a lot of people have struggled to really win in the commercialization effort of this. So can you talk more about that? Sure. And there's been a lot of very eloquent uh, presenters like Elon Musk that have been out there uh, talking about energy storage. So one of the confusing things is when you talk about what the cost of these different solutions is. And you get confused because people will talk about the battery cell at the DC level, which from there you have to put battery management inverters, you have to take it up to AC power, and you have to actually install it. So uh, one of the, uh, I, I was listening to a talk by someone at PNNL that talked about the uh, Elon Musk and the Tesla lithium ion battery, where I think the target's somewhere around $150 a kilowatt hour at the battery cell level. That's coming out of the gigafactory. But you have to add these other things. By the time you install it, that's going to be, at a residential level, it's probably more in the six to $700 per kilowatt hour range. Flow batteries, when you're talking long duration, uh, have the opportunity to get the cost per kilowatt hour down because you, you're really buying more electrolyte in most cases. Uh, but if all you have is a one-hour or two-hour type uh, application, that's the most storage that you need, then things like the lithium-ion is probably as competitive as anything. So that's a, that's a little bit of a distinction. And it is a very crowded place. There's a lot of innovation going on, a lot of companies moving quickly. What's that? Other flow batteries. Uh, so the major other flow batteries are uh, vanadium. 
and a zinc bromine, and uh, the vanadium's been around a while. The issue we think with vanadium is the cost of the electrolyte. It's probably about eight or ten times more expensive than the iron-based electrolyte. Uh, and you have some uh, environmental issues with that, and you certainly do with the bromine in a zinc bromine type battery. Uh, so we think that we're going to be uh, at the low end of the competitive range in terms of cost uh, relative to long duration flow batteries. Great. Well, that looks like it. Okay. Bill, thank, thank you. you.